Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another great guest today, another jack-of-all-trades in the chess world. He is a strong uh, chess master, rated 2350 USCF. Uh, He is a chess teacher, he is a musician, and he is fresh from the chess train in Europe. Alex King, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ben. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here on the podcast. Uh, It's been the dream of mine to be here ever since I first started listening to the podcast. So thanks for having me. Well, dreams do come true, Alex. <laughs> um, so, Alex, you're you're basically the king of chess Facebook. I was uh, I wrote a little note to my Patreon supporters and mentioned that I'm I'm more into chess Twitter, although I am involved in chess Facebook. But you've got a big following, and you, you know you cover events and you post pictures and post puzzles and so on and so forth. And you covered your trip on the chess train. And of course, as a as a strong player and a teacher, you've you've always been someone I had in mind as a guest at some point. But when I saw these pictures. I realized that the timing was great. So why don't you tell, start by telling us about what the chess train is and how you found out about it. So the chess train is a tournament, um, an 11 round rapid tournament. It's uh, unrated. It takes place on a train traveling through central Europe. And the tournament is in its eighth year this year. Um, and it's organized by the Prague Chess Society, Prague Czech Republic, or Czechia, as I think maybe they call it now. Um, and so um, it takes place over five days, the tournament does. Uh, so um, the players, uh, of whom there were like about 100, at least this year, uh, the players board the train in Prague, and the train travels to... Um, other cities in the area in Central Europe Um, and while the train is in transit uh, from city to city the rounds of the tournament are played on the train while it's moving and then you land in uh, the next city and all the participants and organizers deboard and get to see the city for the afternoon and evening and spend the night there and then you get back on the train the next morning and play some more rounds of the tournament while you're uh, on route to uh, the next city. So uh, yeah, this, the, the uh, itinerary of cities is different every year. This year, um, we started in Prague, then we went to Ostrava, uh, also in the Czech Republic, and then on to Warsaw and Krakow in Poland, um, and then back to the Czech Republic to a smaller town called Hradec Kralova, or Kralova um, and then back to Prague. Uh, Pradets probably actually means uh, Castle of the Queen, <laughs> so it was almost chess-themed. Um, but in previous years, the, they've um, gone through Germany and Austria, and uh, I don't know where all, but um, yeah, so it was it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, I mean, definitely the most fun thing that I've ever done in my life. Oh, wow. That's a strong <laughs> statement. I mean, I just can't think of any other like period of of like five days where I was having so much like fun, like, like relentless fun. Um, my wife came with me, you know, so that's, uh, that helped a lot. And, uh, she, and she managed to have fun too, despite the, uh, distraction of the chess tournament. <laughs> she, she did have a great time actually, you know? Um, I mean, I was, uh, I was, you know, a, a little bit worried that she might get bored or something on the train, but I don't think it was really an issue for her. She's like a voracious reader. So she plowed through like stacks of New Yorkers and several books on the train and had a good time hanging out with um, other um, companions of the tournament participants. Um, And so, uh, so yeah, she had a great time. And then of course, you know, when we deboarded and explored the various cities, you know, she and I had a great time uh, looking around, eating uh, amazing food, so much meat and beer. Beer is cheaper than water there <laughs> right. in the world. So, um, and uh, 
yeah, like great museums. And uh, before we before we got to Prague, we spent a few days in Budapest, Hungary, um, staying with some family of mine that I'd never met before, uh, some cousins, Hungarian cousins on my Hungarian side. So um, yeah, she had a great time too. The whole thing was was uh, the whole thing was great. So. Yeah, it sounds like our wives are of a similar mind, Alex. My wife, I, she would be in hell if we, I took her to a chess tournament at like um, an airport hotel and she was tucked <laughs> there all weekend. But if she could visit different cities every day and eat good food and read all day and there's something soothing about being on the train, she would be totally fine with that. Well, you know, like um, it was the first time that uh, Kotlin or I had been in Europe uh, ever. So... I mean, it's hard to mess that up, you know. So, yeah, she she really loved it. As far as the train being soothing, that was another thing I was a little bit concerned about ahead of time. Like, would I would I get train sick? You know, I don't remember the last time I was on a train for that long, but actually, it didn't bother me at all. I liked it a lot. I think that probably uh, I was bothered a lot less by the the movements of the train and the sounds of the train than some of the other participants. <laughs> so. And what about the chess pieces being dislodged? I'm sure I'm not the first person to wonder about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that might happen, but it uh, it there were there were the train never got like jerky enough to to actually knock pieces down or anything. Um, so I mean, there were there were a few moments where like things were jolted slightly, but yeah, I don't remember any chess pieces falling down or anything. Actually, a funny thing happened before the first round. You know, all the participants were gathered together. Um, well, I was in the, I was in the, the uh, train car that had the top ten boards, and so you know we're all sitting there getting ready to start the first round. Um, it's in the morning, you know, and the announcer, and the train is already moving, and the or- chief organizer, uh, Pavel Matosha, um, is there, you know, about to, you know, make he's like making his announcements, and then at, right as he's about to say, you know, okay, let's begin the first round, we go through a tunnel, and the entire train is like plunged into. You know, <laughs> pitch blackness for like 30 seconds you know so everybody's laughing like great is it going to be like this the whole tournament you know right but uh and then then the the lights came on and your queen was missing no that's exactly right the lights came on 30 seconds later and like on the first board the guy who's playing the first board i am you know like he's he's played like you know f5 e5 d5 c5 (laughs) right yeah before the game starts Uh (laughs) <laughs> that was pretty funny, uh, but other than other than that, there weren't really any disruptions. At least to me, I didn't feel distracted or anything. Man, it sounds so awesome! And just to give our listeners a little more background, Alex, you're 29. I'm 29. Yes, I'll I'll be 30 in January. Yeah, and you uh you <laughs> did quite well in the tournament, so you're gonna gonna give us a blow by blow in the second. But uh, I I was surprised to hear that there were a hundred people. That's it. You know, just looking at your pictures, it. It seemed, um, I would have guessed it was a smaller amount. So that's, um, I mean, how many cars was the train? Were there other people besides the chess people on the train? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just saying that there were 100 players in the tournament. That doesn't even count the, the companions and the organizers and everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all my pictures uh, <laughs> were just of the top car, but I managed to stay in the top car the whole time, you know, the top 10 boards. Yeah, but- we should say you finished second, right? I did finish second. Yeah, I finished. I, I came into the tournament, I think, fifth seed, and I finished second. Um, and I had a very good start, you know. So I I, I stayed on, you know, on the top boards the whole time. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were several there were several cars. I mean, I guess there were like there were like f- uh, uh, maybe five cars each with ten boards. So that's about a hundred players. And then there were additional cars. You know, there were like two dining cars. There was a car where the organizers were. Um, there was uh, a car where the luggage was, and there was another car where all the companions sat um, in their little cabins. You know, in between rounds, that's where uh, the players would go. You know, to debrief in between rounds and stuff. So yeah. Um, okay, and um, and for listeners interested in the chess train, we'll put a little information on it. I also may at some point endeavor to have the the organizer of the the chess train, whose name you mentioned. Uh, yeah, Pavel. He, he would be a great guest, I think. I mean, uh, I was going to mention that to you anyway. Yeah, he, he would be a, a very fascinating person in the work. I think he does other work for the Prague Chess Society, too. Um, I think he, he may be involved in these um, 
you know, uh, one-on-one matches that David Navarra plays, you know, the top oh, okay. plays every year. Uh, I'm not sure if it's his organization, the Prague Trust Society, that runs those matches, but I, I know that there's, like, a link to the to that match on the Prague Chess Society website, you know, so um, he would at least have some insight into that stuff. Um, okay, and our, our mutual, now my virtual friend, your real-life friend, Posse, also mentioned that he, that he might be interested, so hopefully we can make it happen. Absolutely, yeah. Shout, totally. out, shout out to Posse. Shout out to Posse, I love that guy. He was, like, <laughs> such a good hang on the train, and he was he had some great chess shirts. Uh, got, nice. Had a little, we had a little, like, mini... Uh, shirt competition among the people. I, I know you've got some good ones. So <laughs> he had some great ones too. Um, there were a lot of good chess shirts uh, on that on that train. So. Well, if you've got a good chess shirt and you leave it at home for the chess train, I I, I have to question your judgment. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. If uh, not, I'll win. So tell us about the tournament. Uh, give us the quick sure. blow by blow. Yeah, so uh, I beat a 1,700 in the first round, beat a 1,900 in the second round. My, You know, my FIDE rating is like 2,250. These are all FIDE ratings. Um, and then I beat like a 2,100 in the third round, and then I beat uh, this Australian, like 20, another 2,100 FM um, in the fourth round. And then in the fifth round, I beat this French guy, like a blitz specialist, also like 2,100. And so I was 5-0. And then uh, in the sixth round, I played... Uh, the second seed, international master Guy West of Australia, who ended up winning the tournament. Um, and I was crushing him. I had white. I mean, I, I, um, I was completely positionally outplaying him in the game, but he uh, sacrificed a piece to kind of mix things up, and we were both getting low on time. Um, then he actually sacrificed more. He was, like, down a rook, but, uh, but things got, got messy enough, and I, like, he offered me a draw. I turned it down. I had a perpetual. I turned that down. I was just really, really wanted to win. I was feeling confident, but I ended up doing it in the wrong way, and and the, I lost control. So I lost to him. That was round six. And then I only had five out of six, but he was already half a point behind me, so he only had five and a half out of six. Then I managed to catch up to him um, uh, by the end of round nine. We both had eight out of nine, and I had just beaten the top seed, uh, the, the only other... Uh, I am in the tournament, Roman Hayetsky, who's a Ukrainian uh, player and uh, trainer. Actually, he's a pretty prominent trainer. He's trained some very strong uh, Ukrainian juniors, including Alexander or Oleksandr Bortnik, um, who's kind of like a prodigy. Uh, anyway, so I beat Hayetsky uh, in round nine. And so then Guy and I both had eight out of nine, and there were only two rounds left. Um, and I think the next highest rated person had like seven or something we were like already very far from the field but then uh in round 10 i drew um another 2100 feet a player i had white and i just got nothing out of the opening and i was it was actually kind of disappointing i uh felt kind of deflated like i was really like going to try to win beat this low-rated player like middle-aged guy you know but uh but yeah really i got nothing and actually i was slightly worse when i offered a draw meanwhile guy won so then going to the last round, guys leading, he has like nine out of 10. I only have eight and a half out of 10. And, uh, and, you know, we're both playing people with like seven and a half or something in the last round. And, um, and it's kind of funny in the last round because, you know, we're sitting right next to each other guys on board one, I'm on board two. And, um, you know, uh, actually guy has a slightly worse position out of the opening and I have like a very comfortable position, complete equality. Maybe I'm even slightly better. I'm playing like a FM a high 2200 feet a, um, and I'm up on time, you know, and guys may be a little bit down on time. And then like guys opponent, um, you <laughs> I, know, he, I know like, where this is going. <laughs> a, he like sacrifices a rook in this way where it looks like he's just like, you know, getting multiple pawns and a piece for the rook and like an attack. But instead, like he misses this obvious move where like, like, guy just like defends everything with his rook and then the guy's just like down a rook and like two moves later he has to like resign and like the photographer on the train caught this moment of right me. that's why i was like, laughing it's <laughs> like looking over at, the, at this board at this, at this guy <laughs> like could have could have really like you know um d- done me a solid uh yeah. wise but instead he completely imploded and allowed the leader to uh you know 
secure uh, clear first where I couldn't catch him anymore. And I think maybe, people, Alex, with your permission, we should use that as the picture for the web page oh, for, for yeah, this that, episode. That, that but you, up, you know. you've, you've got to work on your poker face, I got to say. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a very bad psychological player. I'm also a very bad sort of sporting uh, player. At, so was know. that face, yeah, was that face before, like, so he makes this terrible move and was it he before the opponent? Yeah, he sacrifices the rook and then and then guy just like makes this move where like everything is defended and like the, like the guy doesn't even get a piece for it you know like he's so did, like, had oh. guy but the the picture where you're just aghast had guy made his reply yet he had or, made his reply and it was like obvious okay. to everyone that the, that the guy was just going to be down like four or five points of material and that's when I'm making that face like looking over like what in the world just <laughs> happened in the past two moves you know you were slightly better now it's like time to resign like what what's you know, and I'm still playing my game. That's the right. thing. Yeah. And like, you know, and that really kind of tilted me because it was like, then it, then it's like almost like, what am I playing for? Because right. I, there's no way I can get first anymore. So I just offered a draw like on the next move. But my opponent, even though he's like maybe slightly worse and down on time, he just turns me down. I mean, he, I, see, I didn't even realize this, but like he, if he had, you know, if he beats me, then he actually catches up to my score and we tie for second. And I didn't realize this. I'm just so stupid as far as like obvious sporting things that most competitors pay attention to. Um, I was just ignorant of that. And so of course he's not going to accept a draw. He has to play for a win no matter what. <clears throat> so he did turn down the draw and then he goes on to outplay me. You know, it's like my time advantage evaporates, but position on the board goes south. Um, and then I, I really didn't even realize it until like an hour after the game that he had caught up to my score in the tournament. And like, I didn't even get clear second <clears throat> after having led the tournament the whole time. I wasn't even going to get clear second. I ended up tying for second with him and with the Ukrainian I am who I had beaten. So the three of us tied for second and I got second on tie breaks, but I mean, we split the money. So, right. Well, I mean, it's fun to be just playing for first, I mean, you're, oh, yeah. you know, you're a bit stronger than I am, but like, I think even at your level, you probably don't, you're, you're not playing for first super often, right? Oh, no, no, not, not super often. Exactly. And that was a, and especially not in like an international tournament like this, not that this was like, you know, like a norm tournament or anything, you know, like I said, it wasn't even rated, but yeah, of course I was, I wasn't expecting to be like playing for first, you know? So that was, uh, um, yeah, that, may, that it, makes it, it fun for sure. Yeah, maybe with more experience in that kind of tournament situation, I would be a little bit more on an even keel psychologically, you know. So it was a good experience for me, you know, competitively. So, so yeah, I tied for second. I won, like, 6,000 uh, Czech Karuna, um, or I think it means crowns. Uh, so that's, like, $270. Um, and then a few other assorted prizes, actually, uh, chess base mega package that i already had and some other stuff like that so yeah i mean it looked pretty good haul i mean oh yeah i wasn't complaining i wasn't complaining yeah and for this is just one more thing on the chess train for any listeners wondering and again we'll link to something with more complete information and this doesn't probably won't happen again until next october anyway so you guys have have plenty of time to uh clear your calendars but what was the elo range of the competitors like um yeah the, the i mean the, the like i said the guy i played in the first round was like a 1700 fide and you know i was the fifth seed you know so i'm playing someone who's fifth from the middle so i mean the entire like middle like um 80 of the tournament field was like um you know like between you just like typical club player range between 1400 and 2000 or something strength. So it, uh, it wasn't, it's not like it's all professional players. I mean, it's mostly people who are just enthusiasts, you know, yeah. who are just like typical club range of players. So, and there were, there were a lot of players who were like unrated, you know? Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, awesome. And there were some, even some kids playing, um, it was mostly it was mostly people older than me, you know. Um, right, because I was going to say, I feel like my I have young kids right now. I feel like I missed my window, <laughs> at least until they go to college. I mean, maybe unless you can uh, <clears throat> convince them to come along. You know? Yeah, um, but <laughs> yeah, it sounds awesome. And uh, you, there was a solving contest, a puzzle contest that uh, word yeah. on word on the street is you're like a you're like a huge puzzle talent. <laughs> well, the 
the um, I think the reason why they had a, <clears throat> a puzzle contest is because one of the participants in the tournament, actually the guy I drew in round 10, um, this FM from Slovakia, his name is Mara, Marek Kolchak, mm-hmm. he, um, he's like a serious competitive solver, uh, and he like attends like the World Solving Championship every year, uh, and so he knows all the big-time solvers like John Nunn and um, Kasper Pioran. Uh, wow. Polish guy, uh, the Polish players are like, they like dominate <clears throat> the world mm-hmm. solving scene these days. Um, anyway, so he, uh, was on the train. He was one of the players, you know, and so he administered the solving contest, which, uh, occurred after the last round. It was, uh, it was, uh, 12 puzzles, each of which was, uh, just a made in two moves, a composed made in two, you know, these problems that are composed to be, uh, aesthetic and difficult. You know, it's not just like some uh, Queen takes H7, uh, Queen takes F7 checkmate thing from like a Reinfeld book. You know, these like mm-hmm. extremely difficult and like geometric, beautiful, tricky puzzles, you know. Um, uh, so 12 made in twos, and then, the, you know, all the participants in the contest had 45 minutes to solve the made in twos. All you had to do was write the right first move. You didn't even have to write any variations or any analysis. Just the right first move, which is called the key move. Hmm. Um, that tells you how hard they are. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, I wasn't really sure if it was going to be much too hard for me, much too easy, <laughs> just right, you know. But... Um, I ended up uh, needing uh, the full 45 minutes to solve the 12 puzzles. Like, I wrote down my last answer with, like, 30 seconds to spare or something. And I wasn't sure whether, like, you know, there was going to be a tiebreaker in terms of how fast people completed it or whatever, you know. I mean, I was pretty confident of my score. Um, But then when we got the results, I had gotten 12 out of 12, correct. And, like, the next best person in the contest got, like, 6 out of 12. So, um I think I was the only participant in the contest who, um, like regularly solves composed puzzles like that. Um, I mean, I've, I've been a fan, sort of an aficionado of, um, composed puzzles. They're called problems of, of problems. Um, for a while, you know, uh, you know, this book, um, by John Nunn called solving in style. I got a couple of years ago and it's all about, problems of various kinds, not just made in twos, made in threes, you know, other more esoteric varieties like helpmates and selfmates and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I had read that book and, um, uh, that kind of stuff really appeals to me. I love uh, puzzle, you know, puzzle. I mean, I love puzzles of any sort. I love normal tactics too, but the composed ones are really cool. So, um, so yeah, I did well in the contest and my prize for that for winning the solving contest was winning a book um, that was actually um, published by, I think the Prague Chess Society. I mean, it's the book is in Czech. (laughs) So I, it's not like I can read the, um, the the publisher's page or whatever. I don't read Czech, Um, but like Pavel Matosha, the organizer of the chess train, like wrote the introduction to the book. It's a book, like a a collection of, of problems by this Czech composer, Matush, um, Mario Matush. And it's, like, paired with these writings in Czech. I, don't, I can't really tell what they are. It's, like, short stories or sort of poems or musings, essays. I don't know. Anyway, the book is really cool. Um, I was reading it on the very, very long flights back to the United States. So Right. And uh, I might miss, well, I probably will mispronounce his name, but Merrick Kol- Kolchak, the, the guy you mentioned who, who created the puzzle contest, said that... Uh, According to Posse Pasanen, said that it, he sees a bright future for you if just if you decide he was to very go. Complimentary of my performance. Yeah, I think he was surprised that someone like got a perfect score on his contest. You know that he administered because I'm sure he intended it to, um, you know, to to not. <laughs> I, I think he wanted to make it hard enough so that nobody could get everything correct. You know, like if they, if they try to make the SAT hard enough that right. no one can get a perfect score. That you know to differentiate the people as much as, much as possible. So, but, um, yeah, I'm just a pretty good test taker, I guess. So, huh. Okay. And that, I feel like that discussion of, uh, your, your advanced, uh, calculation abilities, uh, dovetails nicely into our requisite discussion of chess improvement. So, sure. uh, I knew that you were higher rated than you used to be before uh-huh. I started my, uh, many hours of research for, 
this interview. <laughs> But I hadn't checked out your rating graph, and you gained a lot of rating points in your 20s. You went from, you know, about 2200 to uh, 2370 at your peak. So basically, you could be an adult approver interview, but we have too much other stuff to talk about. But you still, I still urge you to reveal a few secrets about how you did that. Sure. Well, so, you know, I played as, I started as a scholastic player. I started in fifth grade. That was 1999 um, in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, and then by the time I got, um, by the time I graduated high school, I mean, I mean, actually by the time I was like in 10th or 11th grade, I, I was, you know, an expert, a USCF expert. I was like 2000 or 2100, but I, had, I had stopped, uh, being as serious about chess, uh, in the last couple of years of high school and throughout college. Um, cause I was really focusing on music, which is what I studied in college. And, um, and so, you know, I had, I had just basically fallen off at about 2100 USCF. And um, <clears throat> after, a, after a few years, like maybe four years or so of, of playing very infrequently, I uh, took it back up again around the time I graduated college. Uh, this was in Los Angeles um, in about 2010, I guess. I started playing again. And, uh, and, um, then I managed to get from 2100 USCF to 2300 something USCF over a period of, I don't know, like a couple of years, like from 2010 to 2000, late 2011 or 2000, I think maybe early 2012, maybe it was when I made master. Um, but I kind of shot straight up um, from the 2100s to the 2300s. So I never really lingered that long. It's not like I broke master, then I dipped down below, you know, then I had to struggle to maintain. Um, I just kind of went from expert strength to like solid master strength. Um, and over that, you know, couple of year period where I was making that improvement, um, yeah, I think there were a couple of, of, of factors, um, that all kind of, um, you know, confluence of, of, of several different factors that led to that improvement. Um, one of the biggest ones was that I was friends with two stronger players than me. Um, Kostya Kavutsky, who's a, been a guest on your podcast, maybe twice, actually. I think he's yeah. F, uh, F, well, he was an FM at the time. Now he's an IM. Um, FM Kostya Kavutsky and also international master Johnny Bekamanov, uh, with whom Kostya wrote his book on the open Sicilian for white. Um, and so the th- you know, I, um, I, I would hang out with the two of them. We would study. We would go to some tournaments together, talk about chess and stuff like that. I feel like that was a big um, influence on me at the time. And it really, having that, like, mini community, you know, that small, you know, but, but very influential uh, little group, uh, study group, as it were, really motivated me a lot. Um, as far as the actual things I did to improve, I mean, a big thing I did when I started playing chess again uh, after college was I, I changed my openings. Um, I had always been an E4 player as a kid, but um, when I started playing chess again, you know, 2009 or 2000, I think it was 2000, 2009, 2010, um, that was right around the time that the first edition of Boris Avruk's two-volume repertoire series on 1D4 came out, published by Quality Chess. It's really some of the stuff that put Quality Chess on the map. Um, and so I got those two books, you know, uh, 1D4, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and I studied those very hard. Um, so if I may interrupt for a second, what, uh, what inspired you to switch? Why did you feel like you needed a new repertoire? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I... I think that my opening repertoire had always been pretty like haphazard um, and sort of piecemeal. Like it, it was never really methodical. It was always just sort of thrown together. Ideas. I'm, I'm familiar with that feeling. Yeah. Right. It's, you know, just like stuff I had seen in books or magazines, like, you know, lines where like, yeah, I, I could like name, I mean, I'm, I'm working on it as well, but I could name the opening and say, Oh, I, I play this opening because of that book and this opening because right. of that book. And not even that book. It's more like I play this opening because I saw this one game. Where right. Someone yeah. wants a beautiful game in this line, you know. So getting the Aubrey books, I mean, and, and, and those books are particularly methodical and comprehensive and principled in their approach um, to, you know, covering, you know, exterminating sidelines, um, 
have it, you know, not having any lines that are based on tricks, but having everything have a solid positional foundation. Um, I mean, the books are large, you know, they're significant. It took me a very long time to read and reread. And uh, so that really totally changed my um, confidence level and my level of understanding of my openings um, playing, you know, switching to one D4 as white. And I still play D4. So, I mean, it, it was a, it was a profound and lasting change uh, for white. Um, even though I don't even play all those same lines that he recommends anymore. Um, but it just gave me a really good foundation and it just gave me an insight as to, you know, the level of seriousness that strong, you know, really strong players take in, in their openings, you know, um, and how solid of a foundation of understanding um, and soundness their, their opening repertoires are based on. So that was one thing, the Auberg books. Another thing, I mean, I, I did a lot of studying of Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual um, at that same time. Those were, those were like the big things uh, I was doing on my own. Um, I was also reading some of the Kaspar of my great predecessors uh, series, but I'm not convinced that that had that profound of an effect on my chest. I think it was, um, I think it was just like having Kostya and Johnny um, to study with. But when we would get together and study, they always liked to study from this book, Perfect Your Chess mm-hmm. by Andre Volokitin, mm-hmm. which is just a puzzle book. Yeah, a good puzzle book. But an extremely difficult puzzle yeah. book, you know? Um, like the chapters are like FM difficulty, IM difficulty, GM difficulty, yeah. you know? So we would do those together, like solve the puzzles together, the three of us, you how, know? How would it work when you did it together? So what yeah, someone... So we, some... Yeah, they, one of them would set up the puzzle. We would all just look at it together, not talking, but just look at the position. And then after, you know, five or so minutes, someone would say, okay, I have an idea. Here's what I think. And then we would just talk through it. Or maybe if it was very complicated, we would play, you know, we would make moves on the board, but mostly we would just talk through it. Um, It was just like whoever had a confident idea first, they would just start talking and we would talk through it and we would either refute the idea or we would keep going or whatever, or we would all, we would refute, we would all refute each other's ideas and we would have no idea. And then we would just look at the solution, you know, so there, there was no strict, you know, method. Um, but we, I mean, it all began with working, everybody working individually in silence, looking at the same board. It was all, it was all set up on a board. That's for sure. You know, we would study each position. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you do that with the Dvoretsky book as well? Uh, the Dvoretsky book, uh, I don't re- remember exactly. I definitely set up a lot of those positions on a board, but I also did a lot of the stuff in my head too, like solving the exercises and stuff, which are, you know, extremely difficult in that book. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, I mean, I, I have always liked to do things in my head, um, a lot. Um, you know, I, I've, I played some blindfold chess too. Yeah. I, I've, I remember in Facebook, uh, you had yeah. some post at some point about like working on blindfold puzzles while, while you were driving. <laughs> yeah. I really, I, I like blindfold. I like blindfold, um, stuff a lot. I mean, I, I'm, it's not like I'm the best at visualization or calculation or stuff like that, but I, I have put a lot of work into it and I, I do enjoy that, that kind of stuff. Um, now, so I mean, we, we asked Elliot Neff this recently, but we might as well get your perspective as well. Uh, so how do you work on, I mean, how do you work on blindfold specifically? Yeah. Well, one thing he said, which I totally agree with is that um, the, the first um, fundamental thing you have to start working on is understanding the colors of every square. Um, and, and when you tackled it, were you already a 2000? Like, cause when he said that, I felt like I probably know that, but I haven't tested it and I've never worked on my blindfold specifically. Um, yeah, I don't think I did very much blindfold stuff until I was, um, at least 1800 or 2000. So I mean, the first time you tested it, did you, did it turn out that you knew all the colors or no? I don't think I had consciously realized that when I first okay to do blindfold stuff. I don't think I had consciously realized um, that it was closely connected to the colors of the squares. Um, only later, probably, when I was... But, like, the, okay, the very first time you test yourself, were, did you know all the colors of the squares immediately, or no? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, probably not as quickly as I do now. Right. Um, but, I mean, it's not even like it's not even like you have to test that in isolation. It's more just like when you're calculating something in your head, when you're solving a puzzle, even a simple puzzle, you know, um, 
just making sure, or, or even just like when you're notating a game, you know, when you're notating your own game, a tournament game, making sure that you do not ever write like, you know, D7 when it should be D6. Um, because those two things are so radically different. I mean, it'd be one thing if you wrote down E2 and you meant D7. I right. mean, those are <laughs> light squares, they're, they're symmetrical about the midpoint of the board. But D6 and D7 are just as far away as you can get. Um, it's actually almost like I, I heard this interview with this guy, Jacob Collier, a musician, where he was saying that he was, as a child, trying to develop certain um, aspects of perfect pitch. And he would... Um, he was being trained by his mother, also a musician, and um, you know she would play a note for him, and he would have to say what it was. And it was like, you know, if she played him like an, an, an A, and he said A flat, that would be like totally wrong. But if she played him an A, and he said D, uh, those are kind of like the same color, as it were, in music. Um, they're related to each other, and so uh, it's almost like things that are that are related structurally uh, are closer to each other than things that are like right next to each other. So I don't know. Um, I, I think just understanding, just, just working on understanding the board, how it works, the color of the squares, the way that squares are connected to each other through diagonals and, and, and files and ranks. And um, even just trying to do a basic thing like mating with king and queen against king, but doing it entirely in your head, blindfolded, um, I think is a great way to practice it. You know, probably even more useful than trying to like play an entire game blindfold in your head. Because there are things that even very weak players can do in their head. I mean, like things I work on with my students, um, you know, uh, like like giving them a puzzle, you know, where it's just like king and pawn against king or something, you know. But the, but the solution is like eight or ten moves long, and and, and I and I and they really want to move the pieces because that's that, that's all they're used to. But but making them, you know, do the it just continue saying the moves with. You know, just doing it all in their head. You know, so I think there, I think there's ways to work on your blindfold ability that are not just like the typical approach of trying to play a blindfold game or trying to play simultaneous blindfold games. You know. So. Okay. Excellent advice. Um. Okay. So you studied the. You switched your opening repertoire, and actually, I want to circle back to that for a minute because obviously, you know, you've you've heard this podcast a fair amount, so you've heard us, me, and various guests, sort of. Uh, downplay the importance of of openings. Sure. So, would you push back against that premise generally, or do you just think it was important for for your particular level? Um, um, I think it's hard to say. I think that there are a lot of different ways to be a master. Um, you know, I definitely know a lot of masters who are much less knowledgeable about the opening than I am, and I know a lot of masters who are a lot more knowledgeable about the opening than I am. So I don't think there's just a one-size-fits-all thing. Um, it's not even like I particularly like the opening the most. I mean, the aspect of chess that I like the most is probably things like puzzles and problems and... Um, Stuff like that, but uh, but I I I I've at least found some methods for studying the opening that have worked for me, um, you know. And so I would say at this point I am fairly knowledgeable about the opening for someone of my strength. So uh, what are the methods? Well, <laughs> um, so uh, one of the big things that I do in my daily practice is um, I play blitz games online and then I analyze them afterward and by analyze them I mean I download the games from chess.com and I save them into chess base permanently in my database my unified database of like 9,000 games all my games I've, I've ever played the ones that haven't been lost to history right. um, and I save these blitz games and I'm talking about like 3 minute games with no increment like and you, yeah and you play a lot of blitz yeah, I play nine. I try to play nine games a day of blitz. And you don't? Do you analyze them right away, or you save them for later? Well, ideally, I would play my nine games, and then I would save them and analyze them after. Okay. But, but I don't always have that big of a block of time all at once, you know, because it takes about forty-five minutes to play nine games of three O, and then you know I try to take at least that much time analyzing them. You know, at least yeah. the amount of time I spent playing them, I try to spend that, that amount of time analyzing them. So. I don't always have like a whole block, an hour and a half of time, you know? So sometimes 
I'll just play them and then save them and get 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 around to analyzing them later. But sometimes I fall behind, you know, by a week, even as much, you know, or more than that. So, um, in fact, I just just today I caught up on analyzing a big backlog of a couple dozen uh, games from the past couple weeks. So, but I mean, I do the same thing with even like um, casual over the board blitz games um, with people. Um, that's another thing. Like like even like. Like just yesterday, I got together with a friend and we played like seven blitz games. Um, and then when I got home, I um, tried to reconstruct them all and save them all into chess base just from memory. Um, now I have a pretty good memory, but also I practice doing this all the time. I mean, anytime I play in a blitz tournament, I try to save the games afterward just from memory, you know, reconstruct them. Even if I only can reconstruct the first 10 moves, I try to save that. And then I analyze these all in chess base, all these games. I mean, every game. Uh, tournament game, blitz games, all this stuff. Anything that goes into my database, I analyze it. I don't leave it unanalyzed forever. Um, and the way I analyze it is, um, you know, I have Mega Database, um, which is a proprietary chess-based product um, of, you know, millions of games. You have, you have two of them now. What's that? You have two of them now. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I can do it in stereo now. <laughs> right. Uh, but... Uh, and a lot of the games are annotated, you know, by strong players in Mega Database. So um, that's especially useful for the opening. You know, I compare the openings of my games. With... So do you do you always play your repertoire, or do you? Because a lot of people mess around in Blitz. Right, right. Sometimes I mess around. Most of the time, I play my my repertoire though. Um, but but I've gone through enough openings over my almost twenty years of of playing chess that you know, I can, you know, switch things up. You know, it's not like I only know how to play the French that I've been currently playing. You know, like I also can switch back to the Berlin defense like I used to be playing or I can switch back before that to the Sicilian con that I played before that or whatever. You know, so I have a few different things I can play. But mostly I just play my repertoire, you know. Um, and, I mean, usually I try to just limit... Um, myself to just learning one new move of theory every game, you know? Um, so, you know, if I play a blitz game, um, and the, you know, regardless of how the opening went, I try to, um, make just, just one improvement, like move 12 instead of H3, I should have played Bishop E3, you know? And I just save that. I, I really don't push myself to, um, cover the opening that much deeper than that. You know, so I at least learn one small new building block from the opening um, of each game that I play, which, like I said, is now like nine or ten thousand games in my database. Um, and then the rest of the game, I analyze just for uh, I just go, I just you know skim through it with the engine running, and I note any big tactical mistakes. Um, sometimes I note some interesting positional things. You know. Uh, sometimes I'll make, um, you know, uh, text annotations, you know, especially if it's a, a more important game, like a tournament game. Um, and if it reaches some interesting end game, you know, like, for example, an end game that's theoretical, that I can consult Dabratsky's end game manual or some other end game book, or, or even better, some kind of theoretical end game like Rook and Two Pawns versus Rook and Pawn, where I can actually consult the table base. Now seven piece table bases are available. You're, you're a sicko for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know stuff like that where it's like I, I'm, I'm attract. It's a, it appeals to me to be able to find out the absolute truth about a certain position, you know, and compare that to what the compute what the engine thinks, um, and compare that to what a human might think, you know. So, um, so yeah. I mean, depending on how interesting the game is, I might take longer to analyze it. But even if all I learn from a game is like one new move of theory, and I shouldn't have blundered my queen here, and you know, it was nice that I flagged him when he was about to take my last pawn. I mean, it's like very that, nice. Yeah, that might be it. You know, right? So, so that that that's one of the biggest things that I think has helped me build and retain my opening knowledge is just that practice of saving all my games, analyzing them. And it's like if I make some note of like some small opening improvement on move twelve, you know, uh, in the Petrosian variation of the King's Indian defense, it's like I might not remember it next time. But if I play nine games a day, then over a period of a couple of weeks, I'm going to maybe get that same position at least a few times. I'm going to, 
you know, if I make the same mistake next time, I'm going to make the same note next time. Oh, should, again, should have played H3 instead of Bishop E3, you know? I make these notes, actually, in my chess base, in my, in my games in chess base. I'll be like, well, four out of four times I missed this, you know, simple right. <laughs> improvement, you know? And eventually, eventually it sticks, you know? Yeah, it's um, like your, your own spaced repetition. Right, exactly. Right, yeah, and th- I think that repetition is key for, for reinforcing, you know, knowledge that you're trying to build. So, um, so that's one of the biggest things that's worked for me, at least in the opening. Cool. And are you still, so you made this big push and, you know, from as far as I can gather on Facebook, um, you're still, you're pushing pretty hard. Like you're still driven to, to get better at chess. Is that accurate? Well, I mean, I actually, um, I am less confident that I'll make that much significant more improvement um, just because I've been plateaued at my current level of like 2300 or 2350 USCF for like, I don't know, five years or six years, maybe almost. So, um, I mean, I know that that's like a common (laughs) outcome for adult players that at a certain point they just stop getting better and they never get any better. And in fact, they start getting worse at a certain point too. So I'm sort of mentally prepared for the possibility that might happen, but, um, but it, I don't feel defeated. You know, I'm, I'm still going to keep trying to work on my game and improve. And I, I think it's still not impossible for me to continue improving. I'm just not really sure. And I don't think I will be sure until I actually do manifest some real improvement. Like I jump from 2300 to 2400 USCF or something, you know, mm. then I'll know that it was possible. <laughs> right, yeah. And until that happens, I can't really be sure that it's going to be possible. I mean, I think a lot of these people who try to pedal methods for improvement when you know those methods haven't even uh, manifested results in their own experience i think they're being a little bit disingenuous i mean it's a little bit like a con you know it's like well how do you know you know that this is going to work it hasn't even worked for you yet so i won't really know unless i do improve (laughs) okay a a couple follow-ups on that number number one it seems like you're you're there are weaker ims in the world than you at chess let's put it that way <laughs> possibly so, <laughs> maybe like 75 year old no there there there's a decent decent minority i would say and i you know i'm not that privy to to you know exactly how strong you are at chess but you know you you're in the conversation um so is that like a significant goal for you uh, i'd love to make im of course i need to make fm first since i'm not even an fm okay uh, but come on that's <laughs> <laughs> well, FM seems quite possible. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, like, for example, like, in at, in the chess train tournament, you know, when I was playing Guy West in round six, and then him observing my play afterward and throughout the tournament, and I beat the other IM, and, you know, I was hanging with Guy and talking, and he was like, well, I mean, you're obviously 2,400 strength, you know? And, I mean, other people have said things like that. I don't know if they're just yanking my chain or what, but... I mean, I, I do and that's think FIDE, that I assume. He, I think he was talking about FIDE. I mean, he certainly wasn't talking about USCF. He's from right. Australia. So, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be that I'm just one of these players that is a lot more knowledgeable than they're actually able to manifest in competition. You know, like I said, like areas like psychology and sporting approach and competitiveness are not strengths of mine. So those things could be limiting factors for me you know, when in fact I have the knowledge of an IM or something. I mean, I don't know that's possible. I'm not sure about that. That's possible. So, um, yeah. And that sort of dovetails into my, my other question, which is you mentioned that your rating basically has plateaued for a period of time. And obviously you're, you're really into working on studies and improving your calculations. So do you also feel like your calculation ability has plateaued or is that still improving? Um, well, I don't work on like normal tactics as much as I used to. I sort of have periods where I work really hard on on uh, normal calculation training, you know, like stuff from the block book or stuff from the Yusupov series or, you know, just like tactics trainer on chess.com and stuff. But I was working on that much harder in that period where I made that big leap from 2100 to 2300 USCF. So, um, Pro- problem solved. I just I just cured your plateau. It could be. Yeah, I mean, it could be that that's part of it, that I'm not working on that consistently enough for a long enough period, you know, and that, that, that that's what helped, has, is holding me back. But 
a lot of stronger players have said to me that they think that things like psychology and um, sporting aspects, time management, um, you know, confidence, um, ambition, you know, things like these sort of so- meta- the soft skills, meta factors. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, th- that those are the things that are holding me back. And, and I sort of have a feeling that they're right, that it's those things that are holding me back more than pure chess things. So I don't, I don't know exactly how to fix that problem. Cause I think it's sort of tied up in my overall personality and my overall, you know, overall, what I like about chess. It's almost like my strength is my weakness. I think that's the case for most people's strength and weakness is that it's sort of two sides of the same coin. You know, I, I notice that in a lot of my students, it's like what, what makes them strong is also the thing that's holding them back. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know exactly how to fix that about myself, but, um, I, uh, I certainly haven't decided that it's impossible to fix those problems, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. And just from, from my perspective here in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, if, whether you made another like big jump or not, if you if you decided you wanted to make the IM title, if you made it a priority, um, y- you could you could probably make it happen. <laughs> well, thanks, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so we're gonna switch topics entirely for a minute because we have a question from uh, your real life friend and my internet friend, <laughs> uh, Ty- Tyron Price. Shout out, uh, Tyron. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm. <laughs> he's one of these people that it's like you feel you know them so well online, but uh, but I don't know what his voice sounds like. You know, actually, you were in that category too <laughs> until moments ago. But um, okay. So, question from Tyron, and he says uh, he alludes to you mentioned that you studied music in college and you're a serious musician. You also post um, post videos of uh, songs that you've composed yeah. on Facebook. So. He asked, uh, do you see a relationship between music and chess? Many players listen to music as they play. I've not seen Alex with earphones at tournaments, but I was wondering if he has any theories about the use of music to help with concentration at the board. How beneficial is it? Have there been any scientific studies regarding the use of music and activities regarding brain sweat? Well, I, uh, first of all, great question. I mean, I love chess and music. I, I In my brain, they're intimately connected. I find them to be very similar, and I think that they appeal to me for similar reasons. Um, they sort of scratch the same itch in my, in my, my brain, in my soul. Um, now, as far as listening to music while playing chess, I don't like to do that. I, I did some of that when I was a kid. When I was like a teenager, I would listen to music. Um, I would listen to CDs, compact discs, um, <laughs> right. as I was like playing on ICC or whatever. But, um, but no, I don't like to listen to music while I play. Yeah, I did that too. And sometimes I'll cue, like, I'm, you know, an old man. So I listened to like nineties hip hop as a kid. And every right. once in a while, the rare moments where I have time to play blitz, I'll try to put it on and think that it's going to like cue the muscle memory. <laughs> and, and I was, I played better then. So I think like, Oh, you know, it'll just flow. It'll just all come back to me. But it turns out that now it's a massive distraction to me. Whereas a teenager, it wasn't a big deal. Do you know the, um, do you know the album grandmasters by Jizza? I, I do not. I mean, I, I know Jizzo well, but I was more of a Liquid Swords guy. Uh, well, actually, Grandmasters is just as, well, not just as good, but it, it's 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 really very good in its own way. It's quite worth listening to. And all the titles have, like, chess-related themes. And a lot of the lyrics have, like, these, like, deep, elaborate chess metaphors. Um, if I can ever get a Wu-Tang member on Perpetual Chess, I might just, oh, have, man, that would be incredible. Might just have to drop the mic then. <laughs> Rizza is, like, a serious chess player, you know. Um, yeah. Anyway, um... But, uh, yeah, I don't like to listen to music while I, while I play, but, um, but maybe while studying, I might, I mean, I don't, but, but, um, but, but I know that maybe some people do. I know that in, in one of Jonathan Rousen's books, he talks about, um, like doing some studying while listening to some music and how that somehow, you know, allowed him to make some kind of revelation about something. I don't know what it was, but, um, I've heard uh, actually Nakamura say something about drinking um, hmm. and how he thinks that drinking while playing is a bad idea, but, but while studying, it might actually be useful. <laughs> so making that distinction between something that might be, that might, you know, grease the wheels. Uh, well, of course. Yeah. Works. I mean, that makes me think of like Christopher Hitchens, just like, you know, <laughs> like the, the, in terms of writing, there's, there's so many examples of like legendary drinkers, just like, 
pounding out material. So yeah, yeah. No, I mean overall, I don't listen to music while doing chess that much. But um, but I mean, there's always music going on in my head, basically at all times. You know, just internally, and and that includes at tournaments. I mean, definitely songs are playing in my head all the time when I'm playing a tournament game. Um, so. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's all kind of swirling around together in my head. Um, I, I, but I mean, as far as just generally speaking, relationship between chess and music. I mean, there there's so many similarities. I mean, they're they're just like languages. Um, I mean, that it's the same reason that chess and math are similar. They're languages. It, it, it's its own dimension. It exists in, on its own plane, separate from the normal dimensions in our world. You know, um, it, it's just a way to connect with people that you have nothing else in common with um, or not necessarily anything else in common with. It's just a universal thing, an expression of, of humanity, those things, um, language and, and, and all art and math and, and chess, you know, um, and dancing. I mean, you know, just like all yeah. these things. So yeah, I find I, that they're, I would uh, never want to choose between them. <laughs> yeah. And luckily you don't have to. And I mean, you don't seem like a sort of a, uh extrinsically motivated person but in terms of like the the music you create do you have like a do you have like a, a vision in mind or is it strictly just for for the pleasure it brings you well i certainly used to have a vision in mind when i was like you know attending music school for college and I thought i was going to be a professional musician but um after i stopped being a professional musician and started being a professional chess teacher <laughs> um uh sort of my um, profession became my hobby and my hobby became my profession. Um, and now I don't have any, um, particular goals musically speaking. I mean, I still, I don't like play gigs anymore. I don't make any money from music except (laughs) I just got paid for something musical for the first time in like years because, um, Dan Lucas. I thought this was where it was going. Yeah, I heard your name dropped. <laughs> anyway, go on. He asked me to uh, to compose, um, you know, music for the new U.S. Chess podcast called One Move at a Time uh, about like music. I mean, about chess educators and stuff like that. Um, I haven't even listened to the first episode that has my music. In it. I listened. It was quite compelling. So we we might as well give it a shout out. So basically, it's going to come out once a month. And the the vision that Dan has is that U.S. Chess uh, listeners have probably heard cover stories with Chess Life, and Dan came on to talk about it. And now they're doing this one um, to talk about sort of uh, grassroots initiatives to help promote chess in various communities. And Jen Chahadi is working on a podcast that will come out once a month which i believe is called girls night out and i k n i g h t yeah maybe i'm uh maybe i'm uh talking out of turn here i don't think so though but anyway that's coming soon and i don't know what the fourth one is but it, it's exciting um and and i do recommend checking out the um the the one that y- you produce the music for yeah and the, the music is actually me playing a song that i wrote and it's like a a jazz trio with piano, bass, and drums, and I'm I'm playing all three instruments, <laughs> not at the same time, but I mean, I, I uh, it's a trio composed of. Uh, okay, because every time I see you on Facebook, you're just playing the keyboard, right? Uh, yeah, all, and that, singing, that, of course. Yeah, that's all I have in in my house here in Memphis is just an electric keyboard. But you know, um, uh, I recorded the music for the podcast at my at my parents' house in Nashville, where there's a, a grand piano, so. I'm playing the grand piano. I'm playing one of my dad's upright basses, and I'm also playing the drums. Uh, you know, so we recorded it all. My father is a recording engineer uh, and a musician. So both my parents are musicians. Um, oh, funny, huh? Yeah, my mother is a guitar teacher, um, and so yeah, we just recorded all of that there and uh, and engineered it together. And so it's it's like a it's like a, a you know a whatever a stormtrooper army of Alex's uh, playing. <laughs> Uh, you know, a band of Alex's. So <laughs> right. anyway, um, but all that is to say that I don't, that's like the first money I've made from music in years. And, and most of what I do in music is just noodling around at home, practicing, writing, writing tunes, you know, making little Facebook videos, nothing special, really. I just do it for fun, you know. Cool. And I'm guessing more of your f- free time at this point is spent on chess than music. 
Um, I mean, it's nice to have both, you know. Um, I I heard this interview with this uh, drummer in Los Angeles, uh, Kevin Canner, where he was talking about when he was like in his teens or 20s, he would just like be in his bedroom and he would have this like swivel chair and he would like turn it around and like practice the drums for hours. Then he would like swivel it around to his computer and play like video games on his computer for hours. And he'd swivel it back around, play drums for hours. And that's kind of how it feels in my house here at Memphis. It's like, I'll be walking around, you know, like play, play the keyboard, you know, as I walk past it, you know, for 20 minutes and I come back, sit, sit at my laptop, do some chess based stuff, you know, get up, go to the bathroom on my way back, play the piano, you know, come back down. It's like what a Saturday looks like for me, you know? So you know, it's, nice, it's nice to have both. I don't, I don't even know which one I spend more time on. I mean, obviously chess, but uh, you know, I spend a fair time on, fair amount of time on music too. Sounds pretty good. And, and I, I also <laughs> want to talk about your, your chess teaching gig. So, I mean, I, th- I think I've pieced together the details from, from our online friendship, but why don't, you, why don't you just tell everyone what you do? Sure. So I actually have an unusual job. I'm a school teacher. I work at a school, um, but I teach chess. So it's a public school, but it's a public school where, here in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, but it's a public school where all the kids have a chess class as part of their um, arts rotation. Uh, with music and art and um, technology. So um, chess is sort of part of the mission of the school. Um, and But it's otherwise like sort of a normal public school. Um, so I'm just a normal public school teacher in terms of like my job description and um, the status, the classification of my job. You know, I work for the Department of Education or, or whatever, you know, here in Memphis, Shelby County Schools. Um, But yeah, I have my own classroom, my chess classroom, and it's a K through eight school. It's called Douglas K through eight optional school. Um, And yeah, all the kids from kindergarten through fifth grade um, come to my uh, chess class once a week. And the older kids, sixth, seventh and eighth grade, um, they elect to take a daily chess class with me. Wow, that's super cool. Or they instead could take a daily um, art class or music class or technology. So they sort of specialize. You know, they choose what they want to specialize in and take a class every day. So, yeah, every every day I teach um, my 7th and 8th grade combined class, which is like 20 kids. Teach them every morning, Monday through Friday, for, you know, 55 minutes. Um, followed by a, a class of like 9 or 10 6th graders that I see every day. Um, and then after that, uh, for the rest of the day, I teach like three homerooms worth of um, kindergarten, first, second, third, or fourth, or fifth graders. Um, You know, and then I like, you know, I'm like a lunchroom monitor and like a dismissal monitor and uh, this other kind of normal school teacher stuff. So, and you know, I have like some planning period time too. So it's just like, it's just like normal school teacher, uh, except my subject is chess. And and, and that's why it's uh, anomalous. Um, you know, that's why it's unusual compared to most chess teaching gigs because most chess teachers in the United States, but well, I mean, and in general, I mean, throughout the world, um, teach chess to kids who have already self-selected for an interest in chess. Whereas the kids that I, I mean, I teach all the kids at the school, but even the ones that have not self-selected for interest in chess. In fact, you know, even the ones who would gladly self-select against Out of it. An right. interest yeah. in chess, you know so in that way it's just like teaching math or any other academic subject where you teach some kids who are very talented and happy to be there and having a good time and learning a lot and then you teach other kids who don't care at all and in fact dislike the subject and would never have chosen it on their own but you still have to teach them and they can't escape either i mean if, right if i if i have a kindergartner who doesn't like chess the bad news he's going to have five more years of it you know i mean if he stays at the school now, he's only going to have it once a week, but um, he's going to have to learn to live with it, you know. Um, so, and that, yeah, and, and that, that's very cool. I mean, that's a cool experience for me because previously all my chess teaching work was, you know, sort of normal chess teaching work. You know, where I would, when I lived in New York, uh, you know, I would like teach after school chess programs um, with, with kids who all wanted to be there and already liked chess and you know, many of whom, you know, played in tournaments, you know, at least school tournaments, um, you know, and I would teach private lessons and I worked at the Marshall chess club. And I mean, it was all like normal chess kind of stuff, camps, stuff like that. And now it's very different, you know, 
and I'm uh, I'm having to learn all sorts of new skills about, you know, first of all, classroom management. Right. Also, so, uh, selfishly, I feel I feel compelled to ask you about like just one or two quick tips for. Sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I have found that the most important thing for classroom management is is lesson structure. So, and that takes an incredible amount of work. Um, so if you have a really well-planned lesson um, with a well-planned activity that's like appropriate for the level of the students, um, then that covers a multitude of faults in terms of behavior, you know? Now, it's still very hard work in the moment, spontaneously, you know, dealing with things that come up and all the different things, all the different ways that kids can act, you know, and, and dealing with differentiation, you know, kids that, with a wide variety of knowledge, you know, it's almost like you have to have three lesson plans every day per class, you know, one for the, you know, for the normal, you know, middle part of the bell curve of ability in the class, and then one for the positive outliers, and then one for the struggling part, you know, uh, quintile or whatever. Um, so, and these are, these are skills that I, that I'm only just starting to work on, you know, and I've, I've, I've far from, from mastered them. Um, I know that chess players like to like, um, assign themselves or estimate for right, themselves. Rating, like, yeah. ratings, right. At things that they do. And I don't even think I'm good enough to have an accurate estimate of my own strength at teaching, but I would say that, um, uh, I mean, I'm definitely somewhere in the, in the, um, <laughs> club player range, you know, mm-hmm. as, as an educator. Um, so I'm like somewhere in the 1,000 to 2,000 range as an educator. I don't know exactly where. Probably a better educator than me would be able to make a more accurate uh, estimate. But uh, but I kind of like that, you know, because it, it feels like... <laughs> yeah, you're like, on the steep part of the learning right, curve still. Exactly. So. exactly. Yeah. It's, like, it's like each week, <laughs> you know, you can gain... Uh, 20 to 50 rating points right. know, as a teacher, you know, so that's kind of nice. So, um, cool. well, I agree that it sounds like a great job. I mean, yeah. uh, like a, a lot more variety than February. that's when I started in February and uh, it's a public school. You said, yeah, it's just a normal public school. Um, so did they have issues with, I mean, a, the funding and B like carving out the time. Like I know those are generally issues within public schools for yeah, so, curriculum th- chess. so this, this school, uh, like I said, it's called a Douglas K through eight optional school. And in Shelby County schools here, you know, in Memphis, uh, the optional network is a network of schools, all of which have a specific theme. And that theme, like I said, is part of the mission of the school. So at Douglas chess is the theme. And so, you know, there is always instructional time allotted to working on that theme, whatever it is. Um, and so the funding for my position and um, what allowed this whole system to get set up was through the optional network, which is like a district-wide, a thing that's administrated dis- district-wide by the optional coordinator uh, or the optional director. Um, and these are all things that I don't like fully understand because I'm not really an administrator myself. Right. But money doesn't, the school doesn't pay for me. It's the optional, it's the district that pays for me, basically. Okay. So that's that's what it allows it to happen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and even if it weren't chess, just the general premise of introducing kids to to lots of subjects and yeah, finding funding for it is yeah. such a such a no brainer from my vantage point. But oh yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Okay, uh, so Alex, a couple more topics. How's your how's your stamina? Oh, I'm doing. I'm I'm loving this, Ben. How how about you? I'm good. Yeah, and and for listeners, we're recording on Alex's anniversary, but but he, he assures me that it's okay. So, my, so my one year anniversary, exactly. Yeah. So so we'll uh we'll just keep powering. My, my my lovely wife, Colin. Nice, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's um. There was another event that I was like uh I was uh thinking you you've, you you f- picked a good wife besides the chess train, but n- now I don't rem- <laughs> now I don't remember what it was. I guess maybe it was us recording now, but. <laughs> Anyway, let's uh, let's hit these topics. So, number one, I mean, you mentioned the Boris Alvruk, um, uh D four series, but I'm sure you have some more chess recommendations, book recommendations for yeah. our listeners. Well, um, 
I also mentioned Jonathan Ralson, all of whose uh, books I really like. Uh, he has three books, uh, Understanding the Grunfeld, Seven Deadly Chess Sins, and Chess for Zebras, all of which I think have been mentioned before on the podcast. Um, I also mentioned Solving in Style by John Nunn. Uh, definitely John Nunn has been mentioned on the podcast before. I don't know if that book uh, itself has been mentioned, but it's a classic book. Uh, highly recommended. Um, I think uh, I think um, Frederick Friedel might have mentioned it. But ah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to also mention some other uh, stuff that hasn't been mentioned as much. So my very first chess book that I ever... Um, owned and read. Um, <laughs> this is actually before I even played chess. <laughs> I I saw a chess book on my grandfather's bookshelf, and I took it home and I read some of it. Didn't really understand, but then I still, uh, you know, I, I kind of reread it uh, from time to time over the years, and I still have it and love it. It's still one of my favorite books ever. It's called The Best in Chess by Al Horowitz and Jack Straley Battelle. And it's an anthology of writings from Chess Review magazine um, from like the 30s through the 50s. So Chess Review was like a Chess Life-like magazine. Um, uh, I think think the two magazines were merged at some point, actually. But anyway, this this anthology is from like the 60s, um, like maybe like maybe 65 or 66, something like that. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a collection of annotated games and essays and, and fiction, um, and like poems and puzzles, like tactics, but also composed problems. That was definitely like the first time I ever saw a composed chess problem. And, and it even includes like stories that, that incorporate chess problems in them. Um, I can't recommend this book highly enough. The huh. best chess. That's a really good one. And definitely no one has mentioned. Them. Yeah, for sure. Um, other books I really love as a teacher, the, uh, Jeff Coakley's books, yeah. uh, especially the red and blue books. Those are the best ones for sure. Um, like any beginning student um, who knows the rules and, and is trying to get into playing tournaments and stuff, I would start them on the red book for sure. Um, and more advanced students, you know, who are at least, um, like, you know, um, like eight or 900, I would start them on the blue book. I do this. I've done this for a long time with my students. Those books are great, Jeff Coakley. Yeah, those are the best um, teaching books. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're the best. Although books. we have to talk about steps too, but but finish your, finish yeah, your recommendations. Steps, if it... steps is good too. Um, as far as steps, I really like the, the um, computer module um, called Chess Tutor, which incorporates... Um, the, the steps, exercises, and some other like interactive games, like playing like with just queen against knight against the computer, um, with nothing else, just queen against knight. <laughs> and, and do you have like a smart uh, board, or do you have a computer set up in your classroom? Yeah, yeah, I have a smart board, so we can do that. Um, you know, we can do that in my class. Um, you know, on the on the big board, you know, and, and have everybody watch. Um, but the, the, the only one last uh, thing I wanted to mention is Edward Winter uh, is definitely one of my favorite chess writers. Um, uh, not necessarily his books. I only have one of his books, but just his website, Chess Notes, um, which is just like basically a column of sorts. Um, it's been columnized in the past. Now it's just like a website of musings of all sorts of incredible uh, writings on chess history. That's what he specializes in history. Um, and so and it's all for free, uh, extensive archives, extremely uh, deep in the weeds. Ex- yeah. But- <laughs> I, I mean, the guy is a legitimate historical scholar and, 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 and that, and there are, there are extremely few people like that in the chess world, the chess world, uh, you know, historians in the chess world are like, um, generally of the, um, sort of um, loose thinking variety, um, <laughs> low accountability <laughs> to actual standards of scholarship. And Edward Winter is not like that. And he has like extremely little patience for, <laughs> for people like that. So he, um, he spends a lot of time castigating lesser mortals. Mm-hmm. Um, but his, his website is incredible. It's just absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I, I highly recommend uh, his website and, you know, and the writings on it. So, and I mean, it, he has books too, but mostly I just read the website. Excellent. 
So yeah, that, those are my those are my chess writing recommendations. Okay, and and you mentioned so with teaching the Coakley books and stuff. So how do you uh, how do you design a curriculum for such a wide array of students? Well, I'm still working on it. I mean, it's a work in progress for sure. Um, and in fact, with the younger grades like kindergarten and first grade and stuff like that, it's um, it's a continual um, process of simplifying and re-simplifying the material, breaking it down to more and more fundamental things. You know, like I have students at my school who, um, you know, they don't, they don't know the letters A through H yet. I mean, they can't recognize some, some of the kindergartners can't recognize the letters yet. Um, some students don't, they, they don't know what a straight line is. Some of the students don't know left from right or up from down. I mean, or at least they can't consistently <laughs> get those things correct. Um, so finding a way to continuously simplify the material in a way that allows them to access it in a gradual, accumulative way um, is is an art. Yeah, and it's a skill uh, that I'm working on. Now, on the other end of the spectrum... Um, you know, the, the most advanced kids at the school, um, the stuff I work on with them is, is more like standard boilerplate lesson plans from chess steps and mm. standard, um, activities and stuff from chess tutor or chess steps or worksheets from chess steps or for the most, you know, for the very most advanced ones, some stuff from Coakley. Um, like there's one kid at my school, an eighth grader who's like 1300. And he actually has a lot of tournament experience, you know, so we work on stuff from the blue Coakley book together. Mm -hmm. But then like the second best student at the school is like unrated, like, but like 700 strength or something, you know, so there's like enormous gap, you know. Um, So so, was there, was there another, did your position exist before you were there? Yes. The the very first person who, uh, who had the, who had my position at this school is like one of the most, um, incredible chess educators I know, Dr. Jeff Bullington, um, who now teaches um, a countywide chess program in rural Mississippi that was profiled right. on 60 Minutes. Uh, yeah. And he's incredible. Um, I actually knew Jeff, um, or rather he knew me when I was a kid, because actually when I was in middle school in Nashville, and I would like go to like the Tennessee State Scholastic Championship, I would... Um, individually and with my team, uh, we would compete against uh, kids that he would bring uh, from Memphis, um, not at, at this school, Douglas, but at some other schools he used to teach at in, in, in Memphis. So I actually got back in contact with him uh, when we moved to Memphis a couple of years ago, and he uh, told me about the work he's doing in Mississippi, which, you know, I recommend that 60 Minutes piece too. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, and- it's quite inspiring. But yeah, so he used to be um, working his wonders in Memphis uh, at a few different schools, including the school uh, that I'm at now, Douglas. Um, And so he was at Douglas for, I think, three years. And then the the last person to hold the position before I took over um, was a guy named Peter Pritchett, who... Um, I knew from the Memphis Chess Club. He's like a 1900 player uh, who's in the National Guard or was in the National Guard. He may have switched like services, like maybe he's in the Army. I don't understand how all these service divisions work or whatever. But um, he he was teaching at the school for like a year or two, maybe two years. Um, but then he got some kind of military reassignment that um, prevented him from being able to continue working there during the day. And he already knew me from the chess club. And, uh, so he just like messaged me one day out of the blue, like, Alex, do you have a bachelor's degree? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, well, yes, I do have a bachelor's degree. And he told me, well, you know, I'm going to have to be leaving this position because of my military reassignment. And would you be interested in taking this over for me? Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of, um, serendipitously came together. But yeah, the, the, the chess program has been around there for like, I don't know, six or seven years, something like that. Okay. Well, I mean, it sounds like a fun job for you, and and they're lucky to have you. So, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to. I'm happy to do it. I'm, I enjoy it a lot. 
I'd be interested to hear, like, in a, you know, in a couple of years, what you've learned, like, uh, totally. how, how you fine tune your curriculum and stuff like that. Totally, totally. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think my outline might be covered, Alex. Although I do have to ask you, um, so your, your Facebook game is very strong. You know, you have a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of puzzles posted, as well as just sort of chronicles of your tournaments and like a bit of chess news. Um, well, actually, I should ask you two things. So. Uh, number one is why no chess Twitter? Yeah, I've never been on Twitter. I mean, I set up an account a few years ago, but I never used it. Um, my wife um, is on Twitter very actively, but doesn't have a Facebook. Um, so I don't know. I think it's just an aesthetic preference. I mean, um, I think, I mean, probably if I had a Twitter and I like took the time to set it up, I would like it a lot. Cause I know like people like, Olympia or Khan and stuff like yeah. that on Twitter and they're not on Facebook, you know, so it'd be nice to have access to that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just used to Facebook. I, I guess I'm just like old and boring, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I hope not. Cause that makes me, I don't even know. <laughs> geriatric <laughs> so and... circles back around. You're right. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, glad to, glad to hear it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why I'm not on Twitter. I just haven't taken the time to. I guess. Okay. Well, I think the chess world needs you there. And uh, <laughs> the other thing is, if I have to get your uh, your bullet point thoughts, I have to get you on the record for the the world championship. Oh well, this is going to be uh, this is going to be definitely the the best match that Magnus has played so far. That's for sure. Um, I think Fabi has very good chances. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if I could really honestly say he has a better than 50% chance, but, um, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't mind betting even money, um, on Fabi. Um, you know, I don't, I don't actually bet on things. Right. I'm, not, I'm not a gambling person and I know that you are, so I'm probably not even phrasing this in the right way, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I love Fabi as a player. I find his, his style to be sort of like delightfully opaque. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, um, you know, there's, there's something sort of inaccessible about the way he plays that I actually really like. <laughs> I like difficult things, you know, like puzzles and somehow his style is like a puzzle. It's hard to crack, you know, it's hard to pin down. Like what is the Fabi style, you know, but he, it seems, strikes me as very deep. And he also strikes me as a generally sort of, fearless, almost emotionless kind of personality. And that's a good match for someone like Carlson, who, whose approach is generally to wear you down, you know, and sort of game you. And uh, for someone like that to come up against someone like Fabi, who's sort of um, unshakable in a way, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be great. I mean, uh, I mean, who knows, really? You know, it's hard to predict. Yeah, I mean, it's a 12-game match. Looking forward to it. I think yeah. that's fantastic, and I think Fabi has excellent chances. Yeah. I'm definitely rooting for Fabi, I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah, I I mean, I, I like them both. That part I actually find harder than the, the handicapping, which I agree. Like, I'm just checking Pinnacle, which is, as you mentioned, I um, have some, some history gambling, you could say. Uh -huh. um, and, yeah, I mean, they've got Fabi at about 30%, which it, it just seems mispriced, you know? I mean, they're three rating points apart. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I get that. I get that Magnus is a favorite in in the Rapids, but like you know, if they played this match ten times, uh, how many times would they be six six? I mean, it's not you know f three four something like that. I would think. Um, I mean, it's sometimes someone's just going to win outright, and some percentage of that time it's going to be Fabi. So. Yeah, I mean, all the people who are saying, like, oh, it's going to be all draws and then Magnus will win and their tie breaks, like, I really don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think right when Fabi won the candidates, some um, other player here in Memphis said that uh, that he thought that he thought Fabi would go winless. And oh, I think wow. that's extremely unlikely. Um I mean, I would be shocked if, if Fabi goes winless. Um, I mean, even Karyakin <laughs> struck first. I mean, it's like, who would have yeah. that, you know? I mean, Carlson is just not, I mean, he's not um, made of, of of stone, you know? I mean, the guy, yeah. 
the guy bleeds. So, um, and even he, even Carlson, in an interview recently said he thought that there would be more decisive results than than in the cardiac and match. Oh, so, exactly. so unless you think that just Carlson's going to win them all, <laughs> it's hard to imagine <laughs> Fabi yeah. going winless. But anyway, we'll we'll find out soon enough. Right. I mean, I would I would definitely prefer for for uh, Carlana to win, even if that ends up like motivating Carlson and creating a monster. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, with a vengeance, you know, but I mean, that'd be better for Carlson too. It'd be better for everybody, you know, just to mix it up. Yeah. I mean, he needs to, he should hurry up though. Cause the kids are coming. <laughs> I mean, I actually wouldn't, I would be perfectly fine if the world champion was determined by like the world cup every year. Oh you know? really? Oh yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't really uh, have any particular attachment to the traditional, you know, chess, um, you know, whatever the word is, the procession of kings, you know, from time immemorial. I'm surprised as like a sort of, you know, chess history buff that 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 you feel that way. I mean, history is interesting. That doesn't mean it's always the right way to do things, you know. Well, that's like, for sure. I think, yeah. it's more, I think it's more exciting and just fresher to, to um, have, it, have it be more, you know, have a chance for more variety in who becomes the world champion, you know, but I mean, okay, whatever. It's not like I hate the current system. It's just that I, I, I don't have any particular attachment to it. Like I said. Gotcha. Okay. Well on that note, Alex, I think, I think we've covered everything at least for, for this session. Yeah. And man, then it was like an absolute pleasure. Uh, oh, it was like, awesome. It's been a dream of mine to be on here. And I just, uh, I mean, as you can tell, I like to talk, but I mean, especially talking with you, it's been, it's really been a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, so I think I know the answer to this, but if anyone wants to reach you, um, wh- how should they do so? Yeah, well, I mean, feel free to friend me on Facebook. I mean, uh, I just have a personal account, so you'll have to friend me. Um, I guess you can follow me. I don't even understand how that stuff works. Um, I mean, I all, you can also email me. That's totally fine, too. We can put my email in the, um, in the episode notes or whatever. Okay. Um, those are yeah, problems. that should be good enough because I'm sure there's a few anti-Facebook people out there. Um, yeah. And for anyone who is on Facebook, I, I definitely recommend uh, following and friending <laughs> or whatever it is, <laughs> Alex. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, either of those is totally fine. I don't have like a website or anything. So you can cool. also, like, you know, add me on chess.com or whatever. My handle is just Alexander King. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you want to exercise your other, you know, cross train your brain, you can try to find a good anagram of Alexander King. Oh yeah. man, you're good at those. Um, uh, I- there's, there's a really, really good two word anagram of Alexander King, which is like a phrase that describes an activity uh, that, that Alexander King might be doing at any moment. So Interesting. <laughs> if you want to, you know, try for that, it's quite difficult, uh, you know, because it's a long, it's a lot of letters, you know, but, right. uh, it's, it's, it'll be well worth your time if you figure it out, or or if you just cheat and put it into a website, right? So solve the, it. The, the, yeah, I'll pro- I'll probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. What thank? <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you, Alex. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, Ben. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, keep up the great work, and uh, looking forward to hearing the next episode. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music, Matthew Passy, my esteemed producer, and everyone who's written a good review on Apple Podcasts or other podcast platforms or told a friend about the show. Every little bit helps. But of course, I'm most indebted to those who donate to support the show. Without you guys, the show would not be possible. And I want to give special thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. Here are your names. I'm slowly but surely correcting some mispronunciations. So let's see how I do this time. Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Ali Morchetti, Andres Krizdwa, Brian Mullis, Carl Labans. I am Carlos Perdomo of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood. I am Christoph Zilicki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas, Daniel Naylor, Daniel D. Schaefer, Daniel Vine-E, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Agard, James Banastia, 
Jason Woolham, Jennifer Valens of OffTheRook.com, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Hartman, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Leo Delgado, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson of the Full English Breakfast, Matthew Tedesco, Nate Salon, Nathan Webster, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Ryan Stone, Steiner Lima, Stuart Katz, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouge, Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Soyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. Catch you guys soon. Mm-hmm.